Censorship of the Movies by Joseph Levinson The Forum, April 1923 Motion pictures are visited daily by 10 million people in the United States and 1,250,000 in the state of New York. These are the figures quoted by authorities in the industry and explain the widespread interest in the movies as a part of American daily life. This industry, with $1,250,000,000 invested, is now regarded as the fifth largest in the country. Its phenomenal growth has taken place within the past 10 years, beginning with the introduction of the five-reel picture. Because of technical improvements made in various departments of the business, the movies appeal to all classes and all ages, and their very novelty contributes largely to their rapid and wonderful success. It has become apparent to students of psychology and to thoughtful men and women of affairs that this remarkable form of entertainment carries with it a grave menace to the welfare of many of its patrons as well as to the interests of the state. Within a short period after the introduction of the five-reeler, movements organized by leading men and women of various communities succeeded in bringing about some official examination of pictures before their presentation to the public. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kansas, and Maryland followed many municipalities in enacting legislation providing for legal regulation of the movies. Notwithstanding bitter opposition on the part of the industry, an opposition that did not hesitate to spend vast sums of money to combat this regulatory movement, large numbers of additional communities throughout the country provided for supervision, and in 1921, New York State, the most important center of the industry for motion picture exhibition purposes, after several years of agitation, enacted regulatory legislation, and in 1922, Virginia and Florida followed suit. An amusing sidelight of the movement for this legislation is the use of the term censorship by the motion picture industry, as well as by the newspapers. This word has been deliberately chosen by the opponents of this legislation for the purpose of making it unpopular with Americans, particularly with those of foreign birth, to whom the term censorship brings back pictures of gendarmes, soldiers, and police prying into their personal affairs. The fact is the legislation in most cases is regulatory, and this is particularly true of New York, where the standards are established by law and not by the Station Motion Picture Commission. Members of the commission do nothing else but guide themselves by the statute when reviewing pictures. Notwithstanding bitter legal attacks carried on by the industry with the help of some of America's leading lawyers, testing the constitutionality of the regulatory laws, the courts have sustained practically all legislation, some of the contests being carried to the Supreme Court of the United States. A few months ago, an effort was made to test the constitutionality of the New York law permitting the examination of newsreels. The industry maintaining that such newsreels were a form of publication, and that the constitutional guarantee of free press permitted exhibition of such newsreels without examination by the state. The question was argued before the Appellate Division of the Third Department of the State of New York, and Judge Harold J. Hinman, in an opinion unanimously concurred in by his four colleagues, held that the motion picture is a spectacle or show rather than a medium of opinion, and the latter quality is a mere incident to the former quality. It creates and pervades a mental atmosphere which is absorbed by the viewer without conscious mental effort. It requires neither literacy nor interpreter to understand it. Those who witness the spectacle are taken out of bondage to the letter and the spoken word. The author and the speaker are replaced by the actor of the show and of the spectacle. Our public libraries are filled with books which, without the necessary literacy, stand uninterpreted and equally dead in the field of thought as an organ of opinion. The newspaper offers no particular attraction to the child, and much that is contained in it that might be harmful to the child is not understood by it for lack of literacy or imagination. But the moving picture attracts the attention so lacking with books or even newspapers, particularly so far as children and the illiterate are concerned, and carries its own interpretation. With this opinion borne in mind, it can be easily understood that the motion picture, unlike the spoken play, the printed book, or newspaper, requires state supervision and control. To appreciate the need of movie legislation, it is important to bear in mind the classes that make up the great majority of the attendance at motion picture theaters. A study of these classes discloses that the movies attract in large numbers those who lack the means of deriving pleasure from a good play or good reading matter, and who are unable to concentrate their minds for any length of time on matters requiring much thought. This accounts for the popularity of the picture with children, who form a very important and numerically large part of the audiences of most motion picture theaters. Professor Samuel B. Heckman, a distinguished psychologist of the faculty of the College of the City of New York, has this to say as to the influence of the picture on the mind of the child. One of the characteristics which mark the difference between children and adults is in their reaction. 
is that the imagination is less modified, is less controlled in relation to realities. That is, the experiences of children are frequently enlarged or magnified, sometimes out of proportion to the thing that really happened. Another characteristic difference is that lack of control. Another, and probably the most important of the differences between childhood and grown-up life, is that inability, particularly as it refers to the screen picture, to see a story through to the end. The child is impressed by the single picture, the single scene, and the activities that it portrays, and fails, nearly always, to evaluate those pictures and those scenes to the story as a whole. That is an influence which bears upon their lives. A film story which may contain some picture of lawlessness or a murder may be accepted by the intelligent adult as a justifiable moral picture, because in the end, justice prevails, and the criminal, if he is one, is punished. But what impressed the child during that picture was the bravado, the kind of activity which the individual engaged in while performing that particular act, and that is what influences his life. He doesn't carry it through to the end to get the justification of the act in its whole setting. According to the census of 1920, the number of children in the United States ranging in age from 5 to 14 years inclusive was 22,039,000, and the number ranging in age from 15 to 20 years inclusive was 11,212,000, a total of 33,251,000. The figures for New York State show that the number ranging in age from 5 to 20 years was 3,126,000. Practically all of these children go to the movies, some with parental consent and others without. And the influence of the picture on the minds of these children is the answer to the opponents of legal supervision of pictures. In addition to children, the audiences at motion picture theaters consist of large numbers of illiterates who cannot read or write a syllable of any language, the ignorant who can barely read and write, and the mental defectives of all degrees, who, according to scientific opinion, constitute fully 10% of the population of the country. While a great deal has been written about the value of the mental tests applied by the government during the late World War, there can be no doubt that such tests have established beyond question that America has an enormous proportion of unintelligent adults. Professor Henry Herbert Goddard, in his book Human Efficiencies and Levels of Intelligence, states that a study of these government tests shows that about 45% of the 1,700,000 soldiers to whom the tests were applied were below normal intelligence. Even if these figures are inaccurate and the tests unsatisfactory, we cannot get away with the fact that our subnormal population is so large that with possession of the suffrage, they constitute a grave menace to our country. An interesting indication of the number of unintelligent and disinterested electors is clear from a study of the figures of the vote cast on several amendments submitted to the people of the state of New York in 1921 and in 1922. In the former year, on an amendment submitted in accordance with constitutional provision, asking for authority to sell old Erie Canal lands, and which had no negative, there were 553,000 people who voted no, while 1,124,000 electors voted blank, indicating that they did not understand or were not interested, the affirmative receiving only 781,000 votes. The total vote cast for judge of the Court of Appeals at the same election was 2,634,000. This was again illustrated in 1922 when there was a total vote cast in New York for governor of 2,589,000, while on an amendment to the Constitution, which simply provided for some technical change in the method of returning city bills to the legislature, and which also had no negative, there were 555,000 people who voted no, almost 1 million voted blank, and 220,000 who voted for governor failed to vote at all, with the affirmative receiving 820,000 votes. These figures show what a small proportion voted with any intelligent knowledge of the questions submitted to them. Our system of government depends on an intelligent electorate. If we are to permit the illiterate and unintelligent to become the majority and sway our elections, our form of government is doomed. It was fear of this that brought about the establishment of our public school system, upon which billions have been spent. Nowhere is a teacher permitted to have charge of the mental and moral welfare of children unless such teacher qualifies by passing rigorous tests. The motion picture is conceded to be far more influential as an educational factor than is the teacher, yet it is contended that this great force for education should be permitted to do its work without any supervision provided by law. The movement for control of the movies, which has developed within the past few years, has spread over the world. England, India, Australia, Czechoslovakia, Sweden, Italy, Honduras, the Philippine Islands, Germany, Poland, the provinces of Canada, and the cities of Japan have instituted various forms of regulatory legislation, or censorship, as the motion picture industry would term it. Nowhere has such legislation been repealed, once enacted. 
It is because statesmen, psychologists, and teachers are realizing the indescribable power of the motion picture in molding thought, particularly with the classes already referred to. That motion picture regulation is now regarded as an absolutely necessary part of the government of civilized countries. The opponents of this legislation have bitterly attacked all forms of regulation. One of the unfortunate features of their opposition in this country is their determination to use the power of the screen as a political factor. They have not hesitated to threaten punishment to all who may oppose them, while promising aid to those regarded as their friends. To strengthen themselves, they have recently engaged the services of a distinguished gentleman who retired from the president's cabinet, paying him an enormous salary so that he may help counteract the strong demand for regulatory legislation. Until his employment, the spokesman against so-called censorship came from the industry. But now, in order to hide the opposition behind a cloak of respectability, prominent ministers, newspaper men, and members of author's guilds are frequently employed to use their powers of persuasion to defeat all forms of legal supervision. In the recent referendum in Massachusetts on the question of censorship, large amounts of money were spent by the industry under the leadership of its new national director to influence the electorate to vote against the proposed regulatory legislation. The industry boasts of the very large vote cast against censorship at that referendum, but fails to mention the vast organization it affected and the large amount of money spent by it. The fact is that the advocates of censorship had no money, no newspaper support, and were unorganized, and yet secured 210,000 votes, nearly 30% of the total vote cast on the question. A favorite argument advanced against regulation, particularly during the Massachusetts campaign, has been that a board of three people is clothed with full power to decide what the people should see in the movies. To those who know about our form of government, this argument seems ridiculous. We delegate all our powers to representatives authorized to do the work entrusted to them, subject to proper court review. In the matter of motion picture regulation, the right to appeal to the courts has not been taken away from the people interested. In New York, the law provides that, unless a film or a part thereof is obscene, indecent, immoral, inhuman, sacrilegious, or is of such a character that its exhibition would tend to corrupt morals or incite to crime, the commission shall issue a license therefore. All advertising posters used for display purposes are also under the same provision of the law, and New York now is spared the vile and disgusting forms of motion picture poster advertising which have graced the fronts of so many theaters of the residential sections. The three commissioners are simply permitted to define and interpret the statute, and their action is subject to a review by the courts. It is interesting to note that in New York State, out of 4,690 eliminations made and 79 pictures condemned in their entirety from August 1st, 1921 to December 31st, 1922, there have been but three appeals to the courts to date, and in every case, the commission has been unanimously sustained, such appeals being decided by the Appellate Division, consisting of from five to seven judges. With much glee, the opponents of censorship point to what they term errors of judgment on the part of so-called censors. Admitting that errors are made, what of it? No one has claimed infallibility for any human being serving as a public official, and motion picture commissioners are no exception. Considering the millions of feet of film examined, it must be frankly admitted that examiners are apt at times to commit errors. But if in New York State but three appeals have been made to the courts, it seems to indicate that the industry has had but very little genuine ground for complaint. An argument advanced whenever control has been suggested and used with great effect during the Massachusetts campaign is that censorship increases the cost of admission to the movies. This is laughable to those bearing in mind the fabulous salaries paid to movie stars and the salary of $150,000 to a main director, who is surrounded by a large staff of high-salaried assistants, occupying palatial Fifth Avenue offices. The Motion Picture Commission of the State of New York for the year 1922 had a total income of $154,000. As the attendance at motion picture theaters averages at least 1 million persons per day in the state of New York, or 365 million per year, the cost of censorship per single admission paid by the producers amounted to no less than 1 20th of 1 cent. The state made a profit of $72,000 on the work of the commission for the year 1922. The ancient cry of interference with personal liberty is frequently used by the movie interests. Of course, motion picture regulation, like all other laws, interferes with somebody's personal liberty. The director and producer who prepare a picture showing obscenity and filth, and whose work is eliminated, are justified in shouting about the loss of their personal liberty. So is every individual justified who has been brought before the bar of justice because of a violation of a law. In the Massachusetts campaign, the motion picture people cleverly stated that their opposition was to state censorship, not to federal censorship, 
an argument which, no doubt, influenced a large proportion of the electorate. They knew very well that federal censorship is something that may come in the dim and distant future. Even if enacted, it might have the same effect as did the federal legislation barring prize fight pictures, which have been shown in various states notwithstanding the legislation, by the mere pleading of guilty and the payment of a nominal sum as a fine. A distinguished Protestant clergyman of Brooklyn, a successor to one of America's most famous pulpit orators, in trying to prove how odious is censorship of the movies, has referred to the censorship of Tsarist Russia. He evidently did not know that very recently the Republic of Poland, although under socialist control and but a few years free from centuries of despotism under the Tsars, has enacted motion picture censorship, and the reason advanced is that practically all the pictures shown in Poland are American-made and are destructive to the moral standards of its people because of the indecent, sacrilegious, and crime-inciting matter they contain. Reports recently received state that Soviet Russia has provided for motion picture censorship. A distinguished authoress whose contributions to the leading American periodicals have attracted favorable attention, and some of which have been screened, has been speaking in opposition to motion picture regulation. Yet, in the state of New York, it was necessary to eliminate from one of the recent picture successes, based on a story of hers, scenes of disgusting sexual degeneracy injected into the picture by a noted director, as his conception of the debauchery and degradation of ancient Rome. It is only fair to say that the scenes were born of the director's imagination and did not appear in the story. In New York, the chief value of the law has been that it has served in the main as a preventative. The directors and motion picture people have been unwilling to invest large sums of money in productions which they feared might meet with rejection. Another valuable result of the law has been the constructive work done by the commission. Very many pictures or scenes condemned aroused heartbreaking wailing from the interested parties because of the financial losses and the throttling of genius and restriction of art. After the changes were made, the commission learned that those interested frankly admitted that the pictures had a more saleable value and were far better in an artistic way. The New York Commission has been eliminating all obnoxious references to various religious and racial groups, a policy which has met with universal approval. Pictures have been presented particularly objectionable to religious groups. One case portraying a nun's violation of her holy vows, although not strictly sacrilegious, was changed by the owner at the suggestion of the commission, a course which delighted Catholic Church dignitaries. In some cases, complaints reached the commission from the Anti-Defamation League, a subsidiary organization of a large Jewish fraternal order, about pictures that were particularly obnoxious to many Jews. It may interest some people to know that such Jewish pictures were made by Jewish motion picture concerns. Complaint, too, has been made about productions portraying Protestant ministers in an improper light. The commission has interested itself to improve such pictures to meet objections. Legal regulation of the screen may have its shortcomings, but based on the experience of the last decade, it must be apparent to the unbiased that resort to the law to eliminate indecent theatrical performances has had unsatisfactory results. The experience in New York City during the past two seasons shows clearly that the legal technicalities involved make it almost impossible to prevent salacious performances until long after the damage to the community has been accomplished. It is clear, too, that the contention of the motion picture interests that the law gives ample power to eliminate that which is immoral or obscene, and that the public should be the censors, is one based on an expectation that if the present motion picture law be repealed, they will be free of the only restrictions that can make them bow to the moral sentiment of the community. The motion picture industry, aided by interests that are financially affected, stands practically alone in its opposition to motion picture regulation. No doubt there is some honest opposition on the part of well-meaning men and women who fear that so-called censorship is at variance with the American conception of freedom. Experience, however, is the best answer to such honest opposition. The same issues were involved in the agitation that went on for years in reference to the liquor question in America. Public opinion would never have accepted prohibition if it had not been for the great army of saloon keepers who, blind to American moral sentiment, deliberately violated laws, using their power for political purposes, and who did not hesitate on paydays to send their customers home to their families without a penny in their pockets. It was this wanton violation of all that was decent that resulted in prohibition, and not the desire to make men stop drinking alcoholic beverages. The motion picture industry should learn a lesson from the experience of America with saloons. Should the men who control the screen succeed in thwarting the moral sentiment of the community, they will find themselves in opposition to millions of parents and others interested in the welfare of children and the development of a healthy, moral, and religious sentiment in the state. 
If the producers can again have untrammeled power to show the vicious, the lewd, and sacrilegious without restraint, they will find that instead of having been benefited by the repeal of legislation, they will have paved the way for wholesale boycott of their productions by the best elements of every community.